Um, I just have a short 15 minute talk for you guys. Um, I, as you've seen me before, my name is Angela Poff. I'm a research associate in uh, Dr. Dominic D'Agostino's lab here at USF. I'm going to talk about the idea of using hyperbaric oxygen therapy as a cancer treatment um, and also as an adjuvant to ketosis and potentially standard of care. So we've talked a little bit about tumor hypoxia. So it actually comes from the fact that tumors, as they grow, they need to supply new vasculature in order to grow past a certain size. And what we see is we, because these um, blood vessels are being formed over extremely um, abnormal signaling, the vessels that are actually formed are very inadequate. They're immature. They have these abnormal shunts and blockages within them. And they're unable to adequately perfuse the entire tumor. And that leads to areas of hypoxia and even necrosis within the tumor itself. And the further away you are from the blood vessel, of course, the oxygen um, content decreases. Now, this um, hypoxia in the tumors actually simulates a large number of adaptive responses that actually end up being extremely beneficial to the tumor. So through a variety of mechanisms, um, a lot of them through a hypoxia-inducible factor, HIF-1, which I'll talk about in more detail on the next slide, um, but also through deregulating some classic oncogenes, um, creating an elevation of reactive oxygen species production, and altering energy metabolism, you get a variety of responses where you have increased angiogenesis, um, the tumor is much more prone to survive, shut down many of the apoptotic signaling pathways. Um, you can result in more DNA damage, especially from this elevation in ROS can cause clonal expansion and a more aggressive phenotype of the cells. And you even have um, a compensatory upregulation of these antioxidant pathways, which keep, um, as it's been mentioned before, the cell at an uh, elevated level of ROS production, but still underneath the lethal limits. And this all very potently simulates tumor progression. Looking more closely at HIF-1, this is the hypoxia-inducible transcription factor. Um, it regulates directly around 60 genes, but its pleiotropic effects can reach several hundred genes simultaneously. Large number of them that we know um, potently increase the cancer phenotype and promote tumor progression, including angiogenic factors, survival and proliferation, and invasion. So many of the metastatic uh, genes and uh, protein signaling pathways that we know of. It also very um, potently enhances metabolic adaptation. So hypoxia very, very much stimulates cancer metabolism and the Warburg effect. So in this diagram, you can see that metabolic substrates and products um, overlap with many of the HIF-1-regulated gene products that um, basically make up the Warburg effect in the cancer cell. So hypoxia dramatically stimulates this um, or enhances this phenotype. So hyperbaric oxygen therapy, this is um, a treatment that is known and used for a variety of conditions. Uh, it has approved um, treatment from the Undersea Hyperbaric Medical Society for a number of indications. I think actually there was a 15th added to the approved list in the past year or so. Um, but it's used commonly for things like air or gas embolism, uh, decompression sickness, um, divers uh, get the bends, um, carbon monoxide poisoning, helps healing uh, chronic wounds. And essentially what this is is a delivery of 100% oxygen. So as you all know, we're breathing around 20% oxygen right now. Air is made up of about 20% oxygen. So breathing 100% oxygen, but also increasing the barometric pressure at which that oxygen is delivered. Um, and based on the gas laws that causes the oxygen to be pushed into the plasma compartment of the blood. And this allows more oxygen to diffuse further into the tissues. And so if you remember those, um, abnormal and torturous vasculature within the tumor, if more oxygen is actually diffusing into the tissue, it can diffuse further into the tumor and actually oxygenate those regions. So can we use hyperbaric oxygen to saturate tumors with oxygen and then perhaps uh, offset some of those tumor-promoting effects of tumor hypoxia? These are just a couple of potential mechanisms of action that have been thrown out there. Of course, the inhibition of HIF-1 um, oxygen shuts down this transcription factor, and theoretically, many of those um, important tumor-promoting effects. Um, we also see through some reports that a lot of the classic metastatic um, signaling pathways um, that 
occur during metastasis are shut down. And so in the literature, it's described as inducing this mesenchymal to epithelial transition, which is the reverse of EMT, which Dr. Seaford was talking about. But I think importantly, it's just showing that many of the signaling processes that metastatic cells are requiring are actually being inhibited. And I think probably the most potent mechanism is going to be an enhancement in ROS production. As we've heard, cancer cells exist at an elevated basal level of ROS production, and this actually causes DNA damage, which the cancer likes, because it allows them to um, acquire more gene mutations that enhance mutagenesis and acquire more aggressive phenotype. But they are very close to the lethal level um, of oxidative stress. And so if you increase ROS in the cancer cell, you can push them into a senescent state or induce apoptosis. This is just an example of some fluorescent microscopy um, that came out of our lab and the response to hyperoxia. So this is just 95% oxygen at normal baric pressure, so not even hyperbaric oxygen. But this is, uh, the red is superoxide production. That's a, the main uh, reactive oxygen species that comes out of the mitochondria. Um, at baseline levels, it's pretty low. After just 10 minutes of 95% oxygen, this is a U87 glioma cell line. We see a dramatic increase in the amount of reactive oxygen species being produced. And if you look closely, you can see the little speckled mitochondria lighting up. They're pumping out a lot of ROS. So hyperbaric oxygen has been thought about as a potential cancer therapy for a long time. Um, it was studied mostly between the 50s and 80s, but people really didn't know what to make of the, th the data. In fact, at the very beginning, a lot of people kind of um, postulated that hyperbaric oxygen could potentially stimulate um, cancer growth. Um, and so I thought it was important to point out that over the decades, um, there have been three major meta-analyses that really came out and uh, broached this topic, and they, they all concluded there is no sufficient evidence to suggest that hyperbaric oxygen promotes tumor growth or recurrence, but it very well may have growth inhibitory effects, especially on certain tumor types. Um, and as we, if we look at the data, it actually appears to be most effective as an adjuvant therapy, which I think is why the literature has been confused on this topic for a long time. So when we look at it by itself, it's largely minimally, minimally effective as a standalone therapy. Some cases you do get some therapeutic effects. Now this is just a table from one of those um, review articles. Of course, as a standalone therapy, it's pretty much only coming from animal studies because they don't do this in the clinic. But you see some modest improvements in different studies, but a lot of them don't report any really um, change at all. Uh, this is kind of what we saw in our mouse model. So this is um, some data that we published a little while back. We were using um, Dr. Seafried's uh, metastatic mouse model. This is 21 days after um, implantation of the cancer cells. Um, these are bioluminescent cells. We see that it looks like hyperbaric oxygen is having somewhat of a therapeutic effect. When we actually survi um, compare survival curves, though, they're not statistically significant. Uh, in culture, hyperbaric oxygen does uh, decrease the, these cells' proliferation and kind of a dose-dependent response um, as you add um, decreasing levels of glucose, which kind of hints as a potential synergistic effect. Um, there was no uh, effect on cell viability, but there was a pretty potent stimulus in the ROS production of these cells. And this is just some other um, example data from the literature showing in a uh, transplanted glioma uh, rat model that you can, with varied levels of hyperbaric oxygen, you can reduce tumor growth, um, decrease tumor angiogenesis, which is of course important, and actually see a pretty um, potent differential gene expression between the treated and untreated animals. So when we look especially at the clinical data that has come out over the decades with hyperbaric oxygen, it's mostly, or pretty much only, clinically been investigated as a um, adjuvant therapy and primarily as a radiosensitizer. And this has been noted before, the efficacy of radiation therapy is directly proportional to the tissue PO2. So radiation therapy look, works in large part by stimulating reactive oxygen species within the tumor. If you don't have oxygen available as a substrate for ROS production, you're not going to get a therapeutic effect. And I'll just show you a couple of studies that really gave us some encouraging results. This is one um, that came out of Koshi's group back in uh, the late 90s, looking at the effects of radiotherapy and hyperbaric oxygen. And what they found is when hyperbaric oxygen was applied immediately prior to radiation therapy, 
They saw a doubling in the survival time of patients with advanced malignant gliomas. We see some um, nice synergistic effects with chemotherapies as well. This is just an example from the literature in rat mammary tumors. Um, in this model uh, by Sturge Group, she's published a lot in this field, uh, hyperbaric oxygen therapy alone was actually more effective than 5-fluorouracil, which is a chemotherapy drug, but it produced a synergistic effect when added with the chemo. We saw the same thing with, um, when we combine hyperbaric oxygen with ketosis. So this is that same model I was talking about here, the two ketogenic diet and hyperbaric oxygen on their own. And when we combine these two therapies, we saw a very potent reduction in tumor growth rate as well as uh, metastatic potential. This is the tumor growth rate curve of the combined therapy. And here we saw, I think it was almost an 80% increase in survival time of these animals. And again, remember that hyperbaric oxygen alone didn't uh, shift the survival curve at all. So this is a super additive effect, indicating some kind of synergism. And we saw that also in the cells. Here the proliferation rate of the VMM3 cells when they're exposed to low glucose, hyperbaric oxygen, exogenous ketones individually, and then we combine them, we see that the cells just very slowly proliferate. This combination also gave us the most potent effect in reducing viability in these cells. And I don't have time to go into this at all, um, but part of uh, our work has also been looking at supplemental ketones, in particular the ketone ester um, that's come out of our lab that Dr. Diagostino um, created. And when we add the ketone ester to that combination therapy, we saw even a more potent reduction in the tumor growth rate. The, this is looking at the organs actually uh, taken out of the animals three weeks into treatment. These are control animals, and you can see um, the cells have spread uh, throughout the entire body. Here we only see uh, the tumor cells within the adipose, and that's where we inject the tumor cells. So we had a very nice inhibition of metastasis. And these animals live twice as long as control animals. And remember, this is a completely non-toxic therapy in an extremely aggressive cancer model. So I think we have a lot of questions that still need to be answered. Um, there's a lot of confusion in the literature about hyperbaric oxygen, and I think it has to do with a prior failure to standardize protocols for the treatment of cancer. And so we get this very variable response um, being reported. We don't know exactly what are general effects from the treatment and what are going to be cancer type specific effects. The literature suggests there are certain cancers that are probably more susceptible to hyperbaric oxygen therapy than others. <coughs> Can lower pressures of oxygen elicit a therapeutic effect? This could have um, major uh, implications for the implementation of the use because there are not um, hyperbaric clinics everywhere. Not every hospital has a hyperbaric unit. So if we can use um, perhaps soft shell chambers which only operate at a lower pressure, if they can also give a therapeutic effect that could really increase, potentially increase the amount of um, exposure or availability to patients potentially. And I think we need to really ask ourselves, if we start combining some of these, especially these non-toxic treatments, are we, what are we going to find to be the most effective combination? And this has really been touched on by almost every speaker today, so I guess it's appropriate that I'm thinking the same thing. Um, I think we're going to have to implement a very multifaceted approach uh, to cancer to really get um, a good response. My hope is that this will not be part of the um, treatment paradigm in years to come, but I think that everything else really does have a very nice uh, spot in our future cancer treatment. And with that, I just want to say thanks, especially to my lab mates and our funding sources. And I'll, I think we have a couple minutes for questions, maybe. Yes. Something that's confused me for quite a while and probably always will. We've shown that the ketogenic diet reduces ROS, but it potentiates radiation, which goes against everything. And when you're using hyperbaric oxygen, that seems to be good. Hyperbaric oxygen should increase ROS. So I guess my question is, have you looked at ROS during the hyperbaric oxygen treatment? Now, I know you haven't looked at radiation, so you're trying to do that as a vibration, but right. it just seems like there's all these pieces 
I can't either. And I think part of that is because um, I think we see some different responses in the different tumor models. So I know um, you've done some nice in vivo imaging of ROS production in the animals with the ketogenic diet, and you saw a nice reduction. Um, we have not been able to do in vivo imaging, but at least in our cell culture, we didn't see a, re a reduction in ROS production in these cells with, the, with ketones. So that could be part of it. Um, I think that in the intact organism, it's possible that the ketones are um, reducing ROS. At least we can pretty safely say that's going to be happening in the healthy tissue, um, which may offer some potent protection to the body. But then if they're also uh, reducing ROS in the cancer cell, as your data suggests, Perhaps that makes the uh, insult, the oxidative insult, that much greater when you apply hyperbaric oxygen. It kind of goes back to Dr. Seifert's press pulse scenario in my mind. Um, but I don't know. I think there are many puzzle pieces that still need to be sorted out about that. Thank you. Can you review the protocols that we use in relationship to that that are talking Sure. So the, um, he was asking about what the protocols we used were. Um, we, uh, gave 100% oxygen at two and a half atmospheres absolute um, three times a week, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, for the duration of their survival. For how long? Oh, I'm sorry, 90 minute treatments. Pretty clinically relevant. This is interesting adjunct therapy. I don't know if you've read the report out of uh, NCI with CD47, Bromospon, Bromospon 1. So it looks like blocking CD47 sensitizes to cell radiation and protects it on the tissue. So it looks like it might be something interesting to put into the model. Great, yeah. I haven't read that paper. It's very interesting. One last question. And, and uh, Mary Flanagan. Um, I, I have some uh, questions that I mean, I'd love to see that added on there. Who shouldn't be using hyperbaric oxygen? We know that there are certain cancers maybe that will be more responsive, but mm -hmm. are, are there certain cancers or certain people, certain demographics that shouldn't be using? Potentially, yeah, absolutely. So we um, understand the parameters of hyperbaric oxygen in, healthy, in the healthy population pretty well, and, what, um, uh, and it's used very often without any adverse side effects. But moving in into a new disease state, I, I'm not sure. I don't think we know that answer. Yes. Uh, I heard something that um, if you could uh, potentially push heavy metals into the brain with the hyperbarics, is that um, um, is I have a certain profession a person that you would <coughs> Sure, that's an interesting idea. I've, I've actually never heard of that or seen any data on that topic. Yes. Oh. I used it with good effect while we were in cancer back in 2009. Great. Also had some non-malignant uh, carotid tumors. I had one that came back. It was come back eight times. Mm -hmm. But they told me that we had a neck tumor that they don't recommend hyperbaric. That's interesting. So she was saying that she's been told that they don't recommend hyperbaric oxygen for head and neck tumors. Um, I know some of the um, reviews uh, actually suggest that they seem to be some of the most susceptible from the literature, so <laughs> I'm not sure with that. That's because they gave the erythropoietin back in the 90s in those patients in course. So okay. That, that makes sense. Thanks, Dr. Chan. Uh, one more. With there being any sort of supplementation that would be prohibited on this, so I was thinking things like uh, patients taking NAC or any oxidants in general. So, I mean, there's the concern, right, that if you're um, taking an antioxidant, you're wanting an oxidative uh, stress response to actually uh, induce the cytotoxic cell death in the tumors, that it could potentially reduce the therapeutic efficacy of hyperbaric oxygen. So I, I would say that's a very real potential.